Hello everyone. Today, today we get to take a little break um, and we get to do something more enjoyable, by which I mean something I enjoy. And we're going to talk about books in translation again. And we have, I don't know how many of these we're going to get to, but these are the books that I've been reading recently in translation. We have stuff translated from Greek. I mean, okay, we have a couple. So let's see. We have one from Greek and one from Latin. Actually, we have two from Latin, but these ones are kind of classics. I'm, so I still have them under translated literature, although they should technically be classics. Um, so actually, I won't go too much into detail with them. But just briefly, these are the other ones. And again, we'll see how many we can get to. We have, uh, yes, oh, for Japanese, we have two. Yasuna Ikawabata, Snow Country, and The Bridegroom Was a Dog by Yoko Tawada, Tawada Yoko. And then uh, we have two German ones. This is by von Goethe. If you know Faust, then uh, then that's the same guy. Uh, the Sorrows of uh, Young Werther, which started uh, what was what's known as Werther Fever. And this is Nathan the Wise. Uh, it's a play that actually I knew nothing about until I found it in the free section um, of uh, the local bookstore, which is awesome. Something else I found in the free section of the local bookstore is this. And I picked it up because I recognize the name, Haldor Laxness. He's an Icelandic author, supposed to, and he won the Nobel Prize, and supposed to be the best Icelandic author. Uh, but anyway, we'll get to this. And this was also translated from Latin, but uh, it's uh, the letters of Abelard and Eloise. And oh, and we have this translated from French, uh, Canadian French, actually, Death Sentences by Suzanne Meyer. Uh, so yes, let's get into it. So first of all, let's go through the classics because I'm, I kind of feel guilty for including them here, um, even though I did read them recently, but uh, I don't know if they should be con considered, well, they're definitely not contemporary uh, fiction, but they're translated literature regardless. This is obviously from Latin, so the way this was, it was Latin on one side, Italian on the other, and every time I read books that are from Latin or that have the Latin in them. I always revert back to a middle schooler. I think because I took Latin as a middle schooler and you end up finding all the bad words or bad expressions and seeing how you would say them in Latin, or at least I do. That's what I did and that's what I did here because Catullus has plenty of that to go around. And uh, I, needless to say, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed actually a lot of his shorter love poems more than the epic long ones that I think he's known for, like the love poems for Lesbia, who is actually supposed to be apparently Sappho. Anyway, whatever. Um, look, let's let's get more into the literature because I kind of want to do that now. Uh, let's do, let's start with this uh, because this was a very pleasant surprise. This was a uh, Letters of Abelard and Eloise. I obviously, like I know more or less the story of Abelard, uh, Pierre Abelard and Eloise, and uh, what happens is during the 1100s, I think, around 1100, uh, they um, they both lived in France. He's from Normandy, or Brittany, or I think Normandy. He was from Normandy. He's a very, very smart guy, and he's a philosopher. He can, you know, think about a lot of things, and he moves uh, to Paris uh, to study under William, William of Champeau, who was, you know, the guy to study under back then, except he keeps beating him in debates and conversation and stuff like that, and so this Peter Abelard makes a lot of enemies because he, you know, makes a lot of people mad, but he's also recognized as being extremely smart and kind of has his own school and his own followers and everything like that, and he gets hired as a tutor for a lot of rich people because that's what happened, including a tutor of Eloise. Um, Eloise was also from a, you know, rich family, obviously, and it turns out she was very, very smart. In fact, smarter, I would say, than Abelard, and uh, he ends up tutoring her. She uh, and they end up falling in love. I mean, two very, very smart people, probably some of the smartest people in France, and they get to talk to each other and discuss stuff intellectually. Boy, girl, they're going to fall in love, which they do. Uh, however, they're not supposed to. A, they're not married. B, he, he's the tutor and stuff like that. And at a certain point, she gets pregnant. Uh-oh. So they run away, and they go over to Normandy, where he's from, and uh, basically uh, he, they have the kid. And then they decide to make things right. They come back and they get married. However, uh, after they get married, she so she isn't living with her dad. She's living with her uncle, Philbert, Philbert, I guess. And uh, then who is still very, very mad at Abelard. And so during the night, he calls a couple of his men, his goons, and have Abelard castrated. So, yeah. 
anyway, all these things happen, and they end up basically in two different, you know, he's in a monastery somewhere or, or working with monks, and she's in a nun or in a convent somewhere else, and they can only communicate via letters, and that's what these are. These are all the letters between them, and they're basically love letters, but they're also really smart, really erudite, really intellectual, and they're really a pleasure to read. I really, I've had this for so long. In fact, I think, I think this is a Borders bookstore uh, price tag. Borders Bookstore has been out of business for over 10 years now, I think. So uh, just goes to show you how long I've had this. And I finally decided to tackle it because I thought it would be long and kind of heavy and everything. And it wasn't at all. It was really a pleasure to read. And I really recommend it. It was just fun to read. I mean, obviously, it's steeped in religion and in the times and all that. And Avalar, quite frankly, seems really arrogant very often. But, uh, but it's still a pleasure to read. These guys are really smart. And they obviously have very intense feelings for each other. And it, it shows a lot in the frustration and the fact that they can't see each other and, you know, they, they, they miss each other. And uh, they, in fact, it seems more Eloise misses physical contact and everything like that quite a bit. Um, so anyway, I, I actually highly recommend this. In the end, I really liked it a lot. Uh, oh, and by the way, someone needs to make a movie about this. I don't know if someone already has. I haven't even checked. But, I mean, they definitely should make a movie about Adelard and Eloise. Because, I mean, you know, two extremely intelligent people falling in love, taking place in the Middle Ages in Paris and northern France. Uh, and they hide. They escape. They hide. They have a son They uh, while well, they're on the run. And then they finally return and get married. And then that's when the trouble starts. I don't know. A lot going on there. I think it's, uh, it deserves a movie at some point. Moving on. So we have the two Japanese books. This is a classic. Of, in fact, he won the Nobel Prize, Yasunari Kawabata, and this is one of the three books they say um, that won him that prize. Uh, we'll get to it in a second. First, I want to address The Bridegroom Was a Dog. This book was so weird. It was totally weird. And I, I, I in fact, I said I rate it anywhere between one and five stars because I can't tell. It's three stories and they're all weird. One seems like a complete dream, but it's not a dream. But anyway, thing. the last one is my favorite. It's called The Gotthard Railway because it takes place in Switzerland, where the Gotthard Tunnel is. In fact, she goes into the Italian part of Switzerland, which is where I'm from. And so I did enjoy that quite a bit. Um, but yeah, this is, it'll be a trip and it'll be weird. I'm not guaranteeing you'll like it, but it'll definitely be a weird trip if you want to uh, read this book. By the way, she also wrote another book called Memoirs of a Polar Bear, um, which was also quite weird, uh, which I read before, so I should have been forewarned. Anyway, now you have. On to the next one. This, I liked it a lot. Uh, so this is a book, Snow Country. It takes place in northern Japan, and it, it, it really made me feel nostalgic, which is weird because it has nothing to do... I didn't grow up in Japan or northern Japan. I didn't grow up during those times in that place or anything, but it really has a nostalgic feel, and it made me feel nostalgic quite a bit. I've read a couple other ones of his books, and they seem to talk about the ending of Japanese ways and the beginning of the Western uh, ways and, you know, to modernity, basically, uh, which, you know, he, he addresses as sort of Western um, in, in Japan. And this, I didn't get that feeling from this, or not nearly as much, but it still had that nostalgic feel. I liked it a lot. It's a pretty quick read, as you can see, if they have really large margins. But anyway, I highly recommend this, actually. It, it was excellent. I, and with all his books, if you want something like kind of with that nostalgic feel about old Japan, all his books have that. Um, and uh, and I, I do think they're excellent. And I really enjoyed this, probably more than many of the other ones. Oh, and by the way, this also got me very interested in, uh, let's see, because I forget the name of it, Chijimi, I think it was. Yeah, Chijimi. Because he mentions it just kind of towards the end of the book almost. But it's this method of dyeing. Of you can look it up. Um, in fact, I'll have a link for it. Chijimi is this method of making cloth using snow. And you need snow to do it. And it's really labor intensive and, uh, and sort of not worth it. And he mentions that. And he's like, because it's not really worth it, people don't come from outside to do it. Oopla. And only people from within this area do it. And uh, anyway, it was, uh, it was excellent. I really liked it a lot. Moving on now. So here, this is this death sentences. I was pretty excited about reading this because I know it's translated from French from Canadian French, and I haven't read any Canadian French authors, I don't think. And so I was kind of looking forward to it. It's a group of short stories. I have to say it was pretty hit or miss. Um, they all have to do either with death or with pets, especially cats. Or with both, you know, and uh, and 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 that's pretty much it. They um, 
I mean, some of them are nice. Some of them are cute. I didn't think, and none of them really hit me, or impacted me a whole lot. But sure, if you want to read something, uh, some Canadian French short fiction, you know, a pretty easy read, then uh, then absolutely, by all means, read this. Death Sentences by Suzanne Meyer. Mia, I guess, because she's French, sorry. I, I don't know much else about her. I don't haven't read anything else by her, obviously, and so I can't really say much. But um, But yeah. That, that's all I really have to say about this. I'm sorry. And in fact, I, I wish I could pick a favorite, but honestly, none of them stuck out. And I remember after finishing it thinking, okay, I'll wait a couple of days and see if any of them stick with me. And really none of them did. In fact, they sort of blended in together in a way. Um, they, they're not continue, like they're not part of the same story by any means or anything, but I don't know. Sorry. That was my feeling about it. How many stars did I give it? Three stars. Yeah. I mean, it's not bad, but yeah, that's it. So, but since we're on the subject, let's go to something else. This, I'm sorry, I gave this thing a shot. I gave it 300 pages worth, took a break from it, came back to it later, did another 70 pages. I'm on page 371, and I mean, I, I'm still not into it. And so that's why I just let it go at this point, because I, uh, I don't know. I know he's supposed to be very good, and I was excited to read something about Iceland. I, I haven't read anything about by Icelandic authors, and uh, I was very interested in this. And but I don't know. It just keeps going on, and it's um, nothing's happening. It's a guy who wants to be a poet, thinks he's a poet, and I understand poetry is supposed to be very important in Iceland. And um, and they talk about a lot of, uh, I mean, you know, traditionally speaking, and you know, and so he's hired for people who want to woo a certain lover or if you need to make a speech to commemorate something, something along those lines. And it talks a lot about, it also talks about kennings, which are very important, I know, in Nordic culture in general. Um, and But I don't know, I couldn't get into it much. There's another book of his called something else that I forget right now. Um, and uh, I actually have the audiobook somewhere, I think. I, I, and so I might give that a shot at some point, but probably not soon. I need a break. I, I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah, a couple, I don't want to say duds, but sort of here. Anyway, let's go into the last two now. By the way, also let me know if, I mean, if you enjoy these videos, please leave a thumbs up and let me know. But also if you want me to do fewer books but go more in depth or if you'd like me to do more books and just mention them more briefly or something, let me know um, because, uh, yeah, I'm happy to go either way. Um, right now I'm just going at the pace that I feel like, so there you go. Uh, the last two are German ones. Let's go with Goethe's first, The Sorrows of Young Werther, Ver, Werther, I guess, or something. Um, the, uh, I know this part was called Werther Fever after it came out. A bunch of people tried to imitate how this Werther guy was, the way he dressed, the way he acted. And in fact, you had quite a few people. I don't know if this counts as a spoiler, but it was written in, uh, in the back cover. No, it's not written in here in the back cover, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say much more about it. Anyway, you can look it up, Weather Fever, if you want. It's very short and um, it's sort of depressing, melancholy. I'd say not depressing. It's more melancholy. I thought it was okay. Uh, no, I thought it was good. Um, I got pretty frustrated with there, especially toward the end, because he's a guy who's in love and he, you know, is, oh, he's in love, he's in love, he's in love, and you know, I have patience for that, but not that much patience for it. Uh, so um, anyway, no, that's it. I don't want to give, I don't want to, no spoilers here. So you're safe. Read it if you want. Let's go on to the next one. This one is one I just finished called Nathan the Wise. Nathan the Wise, by the way, you can link to my Goodreads account down in the description. Feel free to add me on Goodreads and there you, you know, because there are, I, keep better track of all the books I read, not only the ones in translation, and I write a bit more about them in terms of reviews and whatnot. So Nathan the Wise I found in a free book bin, um, like some other ones, and uh, and I'm very glad I did, because I knew nothing about it. And it's a play, it's about this guy called Nathan the Wise, it takes place in, it's written in the 1700s, but it takes place in, um, well, it takes place during the Crusades. It takes place during the Crusades, so Constantinople, or not Constantinople, why did I say Constantinople, that's weird, uh, in, um, in the holy city, Jerusalem. I, I can't think of words anymore. I, I need to take a break. In fact, this, this video has been going on for a while, so this is where we'll end it. Anyway, Nathan the Wise, um, yeah, I liked it quite a bit. Obviously, it's about religion, it's about tolerance of religion, and it has Judaism, it has uh, Christianity, and it has Islam, 
and it's excellent. In fact, I think many people, many politicians, you know, could probably read this nowadays and uh, get something from it. So recommend it to your local politician and feel free to look for it. Apparently, this is the only translation in English, uh, the one by Ronald Schechter, um, which is weird because I thought it was a classic. I mean, I didn't know anything about it before getting it, but I was under the impression after looking it up that it was a classic. Anyway, uh, it was, um, I, it's very short. So even here, most of this book is taken up with, you know, the notes and the introduction and the times and the, and all that. Which, by the way, whenever I read books, I never read. I, if I want to read the introduction or the background, I'll do it later. But usually, at least starting out, I want to read the book as the author intended it to be read from the beginning. And that's it. And uh, so, yeah, here, that's all that. I mean, anyway, you can finish this in a day is what I'm saying. So uh, that's it for my reviews of contemporary translated, or in some cases not contemporary at all, but translated works um, and uh, that have been translated from Latin, from ancient Greek, from German, from Finnish, from French, from Japanese. And yes, I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know if you did or if you did not. Here, this probably makes more sense. And uh, please let me know which one your favorite is or which one you look most forward to reading because I'd be curious and I'd be happy to tell you more about it as well. Or feel free to let me know if you've read any of these books and if you have any thoughts about them as well because I'd be happy to hear about them. Uh, as you know, make, talking about these books in translation is a, is a pleasure for me and so I like doing it. So there you go. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this video and I will see you in the next one. Okay, thanks. Bye. Savedum.